Welcome everyone to Legal Considerations when starting a small business. I will be your host for today's webinar. My name is Mike DeLuisio. Uh, I'm an associate here at Kelly Santini. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that we will be sending you a copy of the slides from today's presentation so you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything like that. Uh, please feel free to send in your questions uh, as we are moving along with the webinar. Uh, I'll be answering as many questions as possible uh, at the end of the presentation. The presentation length is approximately 35 minutes long. Uh, it may run a little bit shorter, it may run a little bit longer. After we're done, uh, I'll stick around for another 10 minutes or so and answer any questions uh, that you have been able to uh, send in here to me uh, electronically via email. So we'll get uh, right into things. This is what we are going to be speaking about uh, today. Here we are. This is our outline uh, of the topics we're going to be covering. So we're going to be talking about the three main ways of carrying on business. Those three ways being sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. For partnerships, we're going to be dealing with partnership agreements and the things that should be going into them. And with corporations, we're going to be talking about liability, uh, issues surrounding where to incorporate your business, the difference between a named and numbered company. We're going to talk about shareholder agreements as well. We're going to finish with choosing a business structure, the issues you should be thinking about, licenses and registrations, as well as some intellectual property considerations. So, what are the three main methods of carrying on business? That is a sole proprietorship, a partnership, and a corporation. Uh, those are your three main methods. We're going to talk first about sole proprietorships. The key thing to remember with sole proprietorships is that there is no legal distinction made between the owner and the business. You as the owner are the business. Uh, there, there's no legal distinction whatsoever. No matter what sort of name you put on the business, at the end of the day, it is you uh, as the owner and there is no separate legal entity. Secondly, you as an owner are not considered an employee uh, of the business. You are the owner of it. As I mentioned, you are the business and so effectively you cannot be an employee of your business if you are a sole proprietor. That's important to remember. A good thing about sole proprietorships is that there are very few legal requirements to start. Uh, if you go to your next door neighbor and ask to mow their lawn and, and ask that they pay you $20 uh, in return for mowing their lawn, you have effectively uh, just started a sole proprietorship. Uh, so it can be very simple, very easy to start. Important to remember for sole proprietorships as well is that profits and losses are taxed in the owner's hand. If you are a sole proprietor, there are not two different uh, tax returns that are filed. There's, there's nothing for your business and one for you. You may choose to keep your books separate, but there's only one tax return, and that is your personal tax return. So the money that was spent uh, in terms of costs is set off against the revenue that is generated from your business and your tax at your personal income tax rate. Those profits and those losses can also be offset against any other sources of income that you had coming in during that tax year. If you are operating as a sole proprietorship, uh, you have to register a business name. Uh, you have to do this if you are operating using any other name than your true legal name. This is also referred to as getting a master business license. Uh, it's inexpensive to do, $60, it's good for five years and can be done online. Um, on Service Ontario website. Uh, but it is a requirement that you do register a name, as I mentioned, if you're going to operate as anything other than your true legal business name, uh, or legal name rather. Also important to remember if you're starting a sole proprietorship or any business for that matter, is that certain licenses may need to be obtained. If you go to the City of Ottawa website and, and even scroll through their licenses section, you'll see that there are, there are dozens of different industries and different sorts of businesses that require specific licenses and some of them are easier to obtain than others and some of them are much more expensive than others. So it's important that you do your due diligence to make sure that before you open up your business uh, that you've obtained the necessary licenses that are needed to operate. There's nothing worse than starting a business and finding out right when you've started that you are not legally allowed to be operating. So as a quick um, uh, conclusion with sole, uh, for sole proprietorships, 
Advantages, it's simple to create and simple to dissolve. It's inexpensive to create, and there are very few regulations that are, are going to tie your hands in terms of operating. There are, however, some disadvantages. One is that there is unlimited personal liability. As I mentioned, you are the business, so any liability that your business incurs is actually your personal liability. It also goes for tax as well. Uh, any tax owed is your personal tax liability. Another disadvantage is that there can be a difficulty of raising capital. You are the only owner of that business, so there are no other investors. Uh, so that limits you to personal uh, wealth that you already have using your own money or getting some sort of loan, uh, which can sometimes be difficult to obtain. There's also a lack of continuity when you're a sole proprietor in that if something happens to you, you drop dead tomorrow, we no longer really have a sole proprietorship anymore. It could take on a different form uh, as you're no longer there. Finally, it's inflexible. Uh, in that you really only have one way of, of, of holding the business, which is you personally, and, and so it limits what you can do later on in terms of estate planning, um, which is a little outside the scope of our talk today, but it does limit you uh, as your business grows. So we're moving on to partnerships now. Uh, what is a partnership? It is two or more people carrying on business together with a view to making a profit. Partnerships are very similar to sole proprietorships uh, in several aspects, uh, but the key difference is that there's more than one person when you have a partnership. The members of the partnership are called partners. Those partners are owners of the firm or the partnership. Partners carry on business uh, themselves directly as part of the business. It's important to recognize that even though we're referring to something as a partnership, it is not really a separate legal entity, separate and apart from its partners. Uh, we're simply referring to a collective group of individuals as a partnership. So people are still acting as individuals. They're simply grouped together, and we call this a partnership. Just like a sole proprietorship, partners are not considered employees of the business. Okay, They are owners of the business uh, and, and thus cannot be considered employees of the business. Partners are agents of one another. Uh, you have a duty of loyalty and good faith to one another. If you have a partner, it's, it's important to recognize that your partner can act on your behalf with respect to business matters in most cases, uh, and that you can do the same for your partner. Uh, you have a duty of loyalty and good faith, a fiduciary duty to act uh, in the best interest of them and, and for the business. So it's important to recognize that this duty does exist. Um, and that your partner has some uh, power as, as well as you. Similar to a sole proprietorship, you have to register a business name uh, pursuant to the Business Names Act. Uh, so if you are going to be choosing to operate as a partnership, uh, you're going to have to do that registration with the Ontario government once again. Now, a big thing with partnerships is liability. There is joint and several liability. What this means in a nutshell is that you as a partner uh, can become liable for all of the debts of the partnership uh, just as every partner is equally responsible for all of the debts of the partnership. So uh, this is important to remember and uh, it can, it's quite a negative actually in terms uh, of operating a partnership. If you're going to go into business with someone, uh, especially if the business is going to be high risk or if you're going to be taking on debt uh, or be a high, highly leveraged company, you are going to want to know a little bit about your partner. You're going to need to trust your partner and you're going to need to want to take a look at their balance sheet to see that, hey, if we are going to be assuming all of these debts, uh, do we all have the funds necessary to pay them off uh, if we do close up shop, if we do take on these debts? Uh, so again, very important to recognize that there is joint and several liability for a partnership. Uh, it, it should be one of your forefront considerations, uh, one of the main things that you are thinking of prior to entering into a partnership with someone. Now for taxation, each partner's respective share of income is combined with other sources of income and taxed accordingly. So as I mentioned, partners carry on business for themselves as individuals inside of the partnership. There's no separate tax rate for the partnership or the business. There's no business tax rate. What happens is that the income generated from the partnership flows through to each of the individual partners and those partners are taxed at their individual tax rates. So there's no separate tax uh, for the partnership. Uh, it is your personal tax rate of each individual partner based on the income they are taking away from the partnership. 
that income or that loss can also be set off against any other forms of income that each partner uh, may get from other sources during the tax year. So as a, as a wrap up here on partnerships, the key advantages is that it's relatively simple to create and run as opposed to say a corporation and it can be relatively inexpensive as well to set up uh, which is a which is a large advantage and it's a big positive uh, there are some disadvantages though and the big one is a potential liability is increased because again you can be responsible for the in, in the entirety uh, of the debts and the obligations and the liability of the partnership uh, and that is an important thing uh, for you to recognize so it should be bolded and should have an exclamation mark beside it because it's an important thing to think about. Uh, secondly, there's less flexibility in terms of ownership uh, as opposed to corporations. So you don't have the flexibility that a corporation offers. And there's also a lack of continuity. The lack of continuity stems from the fact that if you have two partners and, and, uh, you know, and one of them decides they don't want to be a part of it anymore or one of them drops dead, all of a sudden you don't have a partnership anymore. Uh, so there's a lack of continuity there. Uh, and we'll find out later that corporations do have uh, some continuity uh, that a partnership just can't offer. Before we move on, we're going to talk just for a moment about partnership agreements. If you are going to enter into a partnership, uh, I highly recommend that you enter into a partnership agreement. Uh, it can be a very critical document. It may not seem that important when you're first starting, uh, but it it's becomes very useful and, and absolutely critical when things uh, deteriorate or if there's a breakdown of the relationship of the partners. Partnership agreements can cover a really wide scope of things. So it can cover the scope of business activities, your firm name, restrictions on carrying on uh, different and competing businesses, uh, requirements for admission of new partners, taxation issues. Uh, big one here is management and decision making. How are decisions made and what happens when there's a disagreement between partners? Another key one are the, are the capital contributions. How much money is each partner required to put into the company? And what happens if there's a cash call? What happens if there's more money that needs to be injected into that company? Uh, how do we decide how much money is being injected? What happens if someone does not have the ability to inject more capital into it? What happens if you want to dissolve the company? There should be a process in place. And finally, maybe most importantly, profit sharing. How are profits shared between partners? If it's not in the agreement, there's typically um, a default uh, setting, if you will, there's an assumption that there is an equal split amongst partners. So if there's not going to be, you should be having that in your partnership agreement. Um, so again, a critical thing to do. There's a second type of partnership. It's called a limited partnership. And I touch on it briefly. This is what, uh, when you think of a silent partner, when people say that, this is typically what they're referring to. Uh, the key feature of a limited partnership is that each partner is limited to the amount of capital that that partner has contributed. It's governed by a different act. Uh, you still have to make a, a, a filing, a declaration uh, with the Ontario government. Two key things. There has to be at least one general partner and one limited partner. The general partner has all of the same liability that partners uh, that I talked about earlier on for a general partnership. The difference is that you can have a limited partner or really any number of limited partners who are limited uh, as a passive investor uh, and share in the profits on a proportional basis but cannot, are not liable and do not have any other liability obligations other than the amount that they have invested. So that's the maximum that, that they can lose uh, and that is their maximum in terms of exposure. Uh, you can also have limited partnership agreements which can give you uh, increased flexibility in terms of uh, possibly switching from a limited to a general partner at some point. A key thing to remember though is that if you are going to be a limited silent partner you cannot hold yourself out to be a general partner or you can be considered uh, as such. So we're moving on now to corporations. Um, what is a corporation? It is a separate and legal entity separate and apart from its owners and those owners are the shareholders. So when you create a corporation you have created a completely separate being. Okay, uh, This separate being can own property, it can carry on business, it can possess rights and it can, can uh, incur liabilities just like you or me, just like a, just like a person. Uh, right now, corporations are the most common form of business uh, organization, says the Law Society of Upper Canada. A positive about corporations is that they can exist in perpetuity. They can exist forever. So even if every single shareholder of a company drops dead, that corporation still exists and there is no lack of continuity there 
whatsoever. That's a that's a key feature that that generally is positive. Uh, shareholders own shares of a corporation, but do not own the property of the corporation. So again, it's important for you just to wrap your head around the idea that if you do incorporate your business and the the assets of your current business go into that corporation, you no longer technically own those assets. You own and control the shares of the company and that company in turn owns those assets. So it's important just to recognize that those are no longer your personal assets, those are the assets of the corporation. It's also important to recognize that because you have uh, created a different, uh, a different being, a different entity, that rights and liabilities of a corporation are not always going to be exactly the same as its shareholders. As you get more shareholders and businesses, sometimes what shareholders, uh, what is in the best interest of shareholders personally may not be what is in the best interest of the corporation as a separate entity. Um, so it's important that you keep that in mind. So as a recap, advantages. Uh, there is an ease in raising capital. That's a key reason why people incorporate. Uh, you have shares that you are able to distribute to shareholders in return for an investment in the company. So there's, there's a much more of an easy way of obtaining funds because you can give different ownership stakes in the business. So that's a, that's a huge positive, okay, is raising capital. Secondly, there is limited liability, which we're going to touch on shortly. Uh, when you incorporate, again, you, because you've created a separate entity, it is that entity that is typically responsible for debts and liabilities of the business. Uh, so it can limit your personal liability as an owner of the company. There's flexibility in ownership. When you have corporations, uh, you can issue really almost an unlimited amount of different types of shares, different types of classes of shares that can have different sorts of characteristics. So there really is a limitless, a limitless possibility of different ways uh, that you can create ownership schemes depending on what your, you know, your particular situation is. There's also advantages in terms of taxation. There are certain lower tax rates that corporations enjoy, specifically Canadian controlled private corporations. Uh, especially if the money is staying inside of the corporation. Uh, you just have a lot of possibilities there and I strongly recommend if you are incorporating that you go and see uh, an accountant and get some tax advice as early on as possible, probably even before you actually incorporate. Now in terms of dif uh, disadvantages, you'll notice the very first disadvantage after uh, our last advantage is, is double taxation. So uh, even though you do enjoy some tax benefits, when you do take money out, uh, in the form of dividends, you are going to be taxed on that uh, money, uh, even though that, that money that is coming out is already from after-tax uh, profits of the company. So the, the, the profits are taxed inside the corporation. When they come out, they are taxed again in your hands. Um, there's more record-keeping necessary when you have a corporation. You're going to have to file a separate tax return now because you have created a separate entity, and there can be annual filings that uh, need to be done as well. So there is going to be additional paperwork, additional record keeping necessary when you do incorporate. There's also a cost of formation and a cost of keeping the company organized. So you may have professional services in terms of attaining uh, a solicitor and also an accountant to help you form and keep organized your company, your minute book, your tax returns, etc. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. So Backtracking a little bit now to liability considerations. People normally think if they incorporate, they have all of a sudden now uh, somehow protected themselves from any sort of liability. That is somewhat true. There is what's called a corporate veil, meaning that the veil protects you uh, from liability. However, especially as small business owners, there are going to be many different ways where you're still going to be exposed to liability. So it offers you some protection, but it does not offer you as much protection as you may think. So keep in mind that as a small business, creditors are generally going to want personal guarantees. If you are going to go in to get a bank loan uh, for your corporation, I can promise you that they are going to want personal guarantees or they're going to want uh, you, know, you to co-sign that loan, which means that you are liable for it. If you're going to enter into any sort of commercial lease, they're going to want a personal guarantee as well. If you are going to try and get a uh, product on credit, you're probably going to have to give a personal guarantee as well. So beware of any contract. Uh, where you have to give that personal guarantee and always be mindful of if you are signing on your own behalf in, as an individual or if you are signing on behalf of the corporation. 
Another way that you can be held liable is that as a small business owner, if you incorporate, uh, you, are, you are most likely, you know, 99% of the time going to be a director of that corporation. As a director, you also have exposure to liability. Example can be for uh, payment of employee wages as well as remittances to the government for things like CPP and EI. You are required uh, to make sure that these sorts of things are done and if the company defaults on its obligations, uh, you know, directors can be held personally liable and there's many different ways they can be held liable for certain things so uh, you need to be mindful of that and you need to be, to be mindful to always act uh, with prudence uh, and in good faith. Now I have insurance here. Insurance is good for all businesses, not just corporations, although it is in this slide. As soon as you are going to think about operating a company, you should right away look to see what sort of insurance you need. Go and see a commercial insurance broker uh, to find out you know, if you need an all-risk policy, if you need errors, uh, errors and omissions insurance. You should be getting that immediately before you set foot on any job site, uh, before you take on any contracts uh, to make sure that you are protecting yourself. Okay, so that's for corporations, uh, sole proprietorships and partnerships alike. It's always a good idea. Now, my third point here is that considering uh, transferring personal assets prior to commencing business can be a good idea in terms of limiting your scope of, of liability. Keep in mind that by transferring assets out of your name, you are really not limiting your risk so much as you're transferring risk to a different area of your life. Uh, some family law lawyers may disagree with, with transferring uh, personal assets uh, out of your name, say to a spouse, but uh, it's important. Uh, it can be a really good tool. Okay, a common thing is that people will take, say, their 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 home and put into just the name of a spouse. Okay, so again, you're you're really transferring the risk from one aspect of your life uh, to a different sort of area of your life. So uh, consider doing this, and keep in mind that if you are going to use this as a tool of limiting your exposure and limiting the assets that creditors can come after, this has to be done early on in the planning stage. You cannot wait until you're on the, you know, the eve of insolvency, as it's referred to, before transferring over your assets, uh, because that can be considered a fraudulent conveyance. So if you're going to do this, it's something that should be done early on in the planning phase. So. Where to incorporate? Because we're in Ontario, I'm going to concentrate on really the two key ones you're going to be thinking of, either a federal company or a provincial company. The key considerations are this. If you incorporate uh, a federal company, you have the ability to carry on business in different jurisdictions. You have a right to carry on business in any province in Canada. So I'm going to say that again. You have a right to carry on business in any province. Uh, on a province in Canada. Now, you're still going to have to file certain forms to, to operate as, say, an extra-provincial corporation, but you have an ability to operate using your corporate name in that province. You do not have that same right if you incorporate a, a provincial corporation in that you have a right to operate in that province, and you're not guaranteed to be able to use that name and to operate in a different jurisdiction, although you can uh, apply to do it. There are different filing requirements. The key one is that if you have a federal company, you have to make one additional filing per year. It's a one-page document. It's fairly simple to do, but there is an additional filing requirement. My final note on this slide, I don't know if I agree with it, but I submit it to you for your consideration, is that there's a thought that if you have international clients uh, or, or contacts that you're dealing with, many of them do not understand our provincial system, and that it, there's thought uh, that a federal company is more prestigious and that it's a Canadian company as opposed to simply a provincial company. I don't know how much stock to take in that, but uh, again, I submit it to you for your consideration. When you incorporate, you can choose between having a named or a numbered company. If you are going to choose a named company, you are going to have to perform what's called a nuanced search, which can be uh, done uh, by your lawyer. It can also sometimes be done online. Uh, you're going to have to get this search to make sure that your name is not taken. You are After you have uh, found a name that is acceptable and that you can use, you're going to have to pick a legal ending. Uh, being Inc. Incorporated, Limited, LTD, Corporation or Corp, or the French variation thereof. Uh, it doesn't make a difference which one you put on the end. It has no, it has no effect on your company other than how it looks and how you, how you think it fits with your name. A named company, slightly more money because you have to pay for a nuanced search, and it can take more time uh, if it's taking you time to find a name that is not already taken and is not confusing with something else uh, and that is going to be accepted. If you do choose a numbered company, it will have either Ontario or Canada at the end of the name or at the end of the number that is assigned to you, uh, depending on which jurisdiction you're in. 
Uh, obviously, there's less identity when you have a numbered company. However, you can take a numbered company and register a business name. Okay, so you don't have to uh, have a, a named company. You can take a numbered company and simply register a business name just as you would as a sole proprietor. Now, similar to partnership agreements, um, <clears throat> shareholder agreements are very, very important, and I strongly recommend that you have a shareholder's agreement in place uh, as you incorporate if you have more than one shareholder. Uh, a shareholder's agreement simply governs the relationship between some or all of the shareholders of the corporation. If you go back to your slide on partnerships, you'll see that a shareholder's agreement can deal with all of the things that were mentioned in the partnership agreement. It can also deal with voting rights, share transfers, and restriction on competition between shareholders. Again, this is a critical document to have, and I highly recommend uh, that you look into doing this uh, prior to uh, starting business as a corporation. There are some common provisions, and I won't go through all of them, um, but there are some, just some things in there that you may want to think about putting in, uh, things like death of a disability and a shareholder and protection from family law provisions. These are, these are types of clauses that go in there to protect the shareholders uh, if there's a disability or a death of, of someone or if there's a divorce or something of that nature, uh, it makes sure that there's control over the shares. Uh, there's also shares like rights of first refusal to make sure that you're limiting uh, or at least giving people that are already shareholders a chance to maintain shares instead of having them go to outside parties. Uh, if you are going to have a shareholders agreement, you can talk to your solicitor about these types of clauses and which ones may be appropriate for you. So we've talked about the three you know, key main ways of carrying on business. So what are the considerations now? We've talked about the pros and cons. Here is sort of a list of things that you're going to want to consider. One, what is legally allowed uh, for you to do? If you have three people, you're not going to be able to carry on as a sole proprietor. It's just not legally allowed and you cannot do it. Liability is always going to be a concern. What sort of liability exposure do you have? What sort of business are you running? What is the volume uh, that you are dealing with? How many people are you touching? If something goes wrong, what are the consequences of that? You need to think about that liability uh, to find out, you know, consider what your liability and your exposure is, and that can help dictate what sort of structure you're going to want. You need to think about the desirability of a perpetual existence. If you are simply opening a business uh, for a very short-term window, i.e. for a couple months to make good on an opportunity, you may not want to incorporate because you're not going to need that perpetual existence. However, if you're planning to operate for a long time, something like incorporating can have big benefits to you. Uh, estate planning. If the business is successful, in terms of estate planning options, incorporating is simply the best option for you. It offers you the most opportunity. Number of owners, as I mentioned, is a consideration, and also the relationship of owners. Uh, we talked about liability with partners and how important it is to, to trust and know your uh, partners. Keep in mind that, so again, the relationship that you're going to have with the people you're in business with is a huge consideration to think about. Finally, in employee participation, if you'd like to give ownership to employees, incorporating is probably a better bet. You need to take into your uh, consideration the costs uh, because you may not have a budget to do everything you need to do in terms of incorporating. You need to look at citizenship requirements because if you are going to be a director of a corporation, there are certain citizenship requirements there. Uh, finally, there is flexibility of structure, the most flexibility being with a corporation, and also taxation. So speak to your uh, tax advisor uh, to try and uh, make the best of your situation. Can you change a business structure if you have picked one? Yes, you can change from a sole proprietor to a partnership to a corporation. That's no problem, and in most cases, you can you are able to change from a provincial to a federal company. Uh, you're not always going to be able to, but you, you are able to. Um, things to consider if you do change. Your business name registration will have to change. You'll have to look at all of your pre-incorporation uh, contracts uh, because things may have to be assigned if there are different entities. Every time you change a business structure, you need to think about your liability, and you need to think about how you're going to be taxed differently. Licenses and registrations. This is going to have to be done no matter what sort of company you have, no matter what sort of structure you use. You are going to be required as a sole proprietor and, and as a partnership to register your business name. If you have a numbered company, if you're going to be operating using any other name than your corporate name, you're also going to have to register. If you have employees, you're going to definitely want to look into uh, applying to, to pay into the Ontario Employer Health Tax 
and workplace uh, safety and insurance board. Uh, business number needs to be obtained for HST, payroll deductions, uh, etc. You can go to the CRA website and I promise you that they will be very helpful uh, in helping you pay them money. So if you go onto their website or call their 1-800 number, uh, they'll be happy to help you out. As I mentioned, you may need certain licenses for certain industries. I always recommend checking bylaws to make sure you're not violating anything in, in the sorts of advertisements or the sort of business you're carrying out. And again, most of these registrations, if not all of them, can be done online. So uh, we're moving on to some of our final slides here. As we, we have a basic primer on intellectual property considerations. Uh, what is intellectual property? It's just intangible proprietary assets. So there's four here that we have listed, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and domain names. If you have an invention, you're going to want to look into getting it patented immediately. Uh, the key one I'd like to focus on right now are trademarks. The only true way to protect your business name or your business mark is to trademark it. Uh, simply getting the corporate name is not a foolproof way of protecting your name. People can still challenge that. It, uh, even if uh, the government allows you to register a corporate name, it could still violate someone else's trademark and they could still have a claim against you. So if your, your mark and if your name are very important to you, especially if you're going to be going across Canada, I, I'd strongly recommend looking into getting your company trademarked, especially if you're going to franchise, anything of that nature. Uh, having your intellectual property in terms of your name, uh, your taglines, and your marks, trademark is, is very important. Keep in mind, trademarks go by country. So a trademark that you get is valid in Canada. If you'd like to go to the States or you'd like to go to any other country in the world, you are going to have to get that trademark in that other country. Domain names, obviously very important to have for businesses. You'd like to have a good domain name uh, which properly represents your business and can bring traffic to that site. However, a domain name, again, does not protect your, your business name. It does not protect your, your uh, intangible proprietary assets. Okay, So uh, keep in mind, trademark being very important because your business name, registering it, doesn't give you any protection. And uh, incorporating using name gives you some but not, not enough protection. And again, the key, the key thing you're going to want to do here is trademark your name. What is a way that you can protect other proprietary information uh, that you have? Uh, Non-disclosure agreements. Okay, and this can be used very early on, even if you're looking for financing and you have a great idea and you're worried about others uh, lifting that idea or stealing it from you. So a non-disclosure agreement uh, is really just an agreement to maintain confidentiality. Uh, it protects your business from information leakage. Now, is it foolproof? Absolutely not. But it is a tool that can be used because at least you have clearly laid out that someone has an obligation uh, to maintain confidentiality and to not use or disseminate uh, certain types of information that, that are meant to be private and that are important to your business. These can be used for employees. They can be used for contractors that are doing work for you, consultants, uh, people that you are, you are pitching, potential investors. Uh, you can use these agreements to bind them so that if they ever do uh, leak any information or ever try to, to steal an idea, things of that nature, you have a document that you can use and hold up and say, hey, you weren't allowed to do this. That concludes uh, our webinar for today. As I mentioned, I'm, uh, I'll be staying on here for the next 10 minutes or so, and I'm happy to field any questions uh, that you guys may have. Again, the slides are coming out to you later this afternoon. Uh, my information here is below, and my number, and you can feel free to uh, look me up on LinkedIn or Facebook, and you can also email me if some uh, questions come up after the seminar that you forgot to uh, ask. So thank you, everyone. Okay, so the first question I have is, uh, will transferring assets prior to commencing a business affect your ability to secure a bank loan? That's an excellent question. Uh, the answer is yes. If you do transfer out uh, large amounts of things that would be used as collateral, 
that can affect your ability uh, to get a bank loan. When you go to your bank, uh, they're going to want to take a look at your balance sheet and see what you have. So if you're looking for a large-scale loan and, and you don't have a lot of assets other than your house and you've transferred that out of your name, then yes, that can, that can certainly pose some problems for you. Uh, however, you can transfer out some other types of assets if you have investments, things of that nature. Uh, you, can, you can transfer out sort of up to the maximum amount that your lending institution feels comfortable with um, and you, stood, you, you should still be able to transfer some out, but it just depends on your particular situation and your balance sheet. Okay, I see one more coming in, guys. Please keep them coming. Um, we have a question from before with respect to uh, using a home equity line of credit uh, to fund your business and if there are any issues surrounding this. Um, there, are, Well, there's a few ways of looking at it. Can you take out, I mean, a home equity line of credit to finance a business? Absolutely. There, there's nothing preventing you from doing so. You, you, you owe that money to the bank personally. It's secured against your, it's secured against your property, and you can use that money as a as a loan to your business uh, in terms of of funding it. Now, if it is a corporation, you're going to want to talk to your accountant because the interest you're paying on that you may not be able to use that as an expense. And I'd recommend that you go and speak to your accountant if you are using it for as a sole proprietorship, you should be able to, to write off a portion of that interest because it is being used for investment purposes. But if you are going to try and take that home equity line of credit and use it for a corporation, uh, you can still use that money, but in terms of being able to, to write it off in, as you may want to as an expense, I'd certainly recommend going to talk to your accountant about it because I think you could have some problems here. Um, we have a question here with respect to non-disclosure agreements. Are they expensive to create, uh, and can a template be created and used over uh, with minor adjustments? Well, well, a typical lawyer answer, it depends. Uh, Non-disclosure agreements can be very straightforward and, and, and fairly simple, um, and they can be quite a bit longer and deal with some pretty in-depth uh, issues depending on who it is that is, uh, what sort of information they're getting and what sort of relationship. I would say that if you, if you go and speak to your to your solicitor about it, they should be able to give you a fairly good template as long as, as, as long as the people that are going to be using that template are all very similar. So as an example, um, your, your solicitor may be able to prepare you one for your employees, which can most likely be used over and over again. But if you do have people that are in a completely different situation, so as an example, an employee and then a contractor and then uh, you know, and then someone who may be a potential investor. Those non-disclosure agreements uh, are probably going to look a little bit different from one another, so you, you typically wouldn't want to use them over and over again. Uh, cost will vary, and again, it's, it's tough for me to speak to it. Some are simpler than others, and uh, I would just uh, talk to your professional uh, there ahead of time um, about what the cost uh, may be. Okay. Uh, unless anything comes in here in the next uh, in the next minute, I think that will basically conclude our webinar. I'd like to thank you all uh, once again for tuning in. And like I said, if there's any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact us.